Hello, this is uh, Raymond Griffith again. Uh, mathematical models. We're in chapter one, section two. We're going to be discussing reasoning mathematically. And what I'd like to talk to you about at the moment is inductive versus deductive reasoning. Two very, very important kinds of reasoning that we use practically all the time. And what we don't realize is how often we use them or how we uh, make things uh, work together. And what I would like to do for the moment is uh, discuss with you two different kinds of situations. Uh, a typical situation that uh, will help you understand something of the difference between these two kinds of reasoning. So in uh, situation number one, uh, we're going to be talking about the fact that you, you know, maybe you go to a bank you would like to get a uh, loan for a car or for a house, okay? And a banker uses your credit score to decide whether to give you a loan and uh, for what rate. There's a particular kind of reasoning that's being used here. Right? You can see that the uh, banker is going to uh, use something that's already given to him or something that he can look up at uh, the credit score and he has uh, some kind of rule that's available to him to tell him, basically, give this person a loan, and if their credit score is between this and this, charge them this rate. If their credit score is between this and this, give them a higher rate. If their credit score is down lower uh, than a particular value, uh, deny them the loan uh, at all. Okay, so we have a, uh, it's a typical situation and uh, uh, happens every day. It's a particular kind of reasoning, a particular kind of thinking. Well then, uh, situation two deals with, uh, say, a group of scientists who are trying to figure out the cause of ulcers. And this is uh, actually a true story. I don't remember the names of the scientists at the moment, uh, but uh, a pair of scientists down in Australia were trying to uh, investigate the causes of a death of this group of people. And uh, these people that uh, they were investigating uh, had died from massive ulcers. This was about 20 or so years ago. Uh, they had just gotten in some brand new equipment, some very high powered, high magnification uh, microscopes, equipment that they had not had before. And so they were excited about using it. And as they were looking at tissue samples, they discovered something unexpected. And they took a look at it. There was bacteria in there. This was in the stomach. The lining of the stomach, where of course the acid in the stomach was, and they thought, oh no, the, these corpses have come to us contaminated, or these samples have come contaminated. Uh, and so they, they went back and they took a look, and uh, no, it hadn't come contaminated. In fact, just about every, every sample, every corpse that they had, they were you know, doing the, the autopsies on had this problem. There was bacteria there. This bacteria was so small that without the new high-powered microscopes, they couldn't have seen it. But there they saw it. And they began to ask questions. Well, you know, what caught, what's, why is this bacteria here? Does the bacteria have anything to do with the ulcer? Now, you understand that uh, people have a lot of ways of thinking about ulcers. A common myth is that stress causes ulcers. In fact, uh, that was a standard medical doctrine for many years, that stress uh, causes ulcers. Well, uh, these scientists wondered if the bacteria 
wasn't causing ulcers. And so they took some of the bacteria and did a culture, put it in a beaker of water, and one of them, I don't know how they chose who did it, down the hatch. Well, within just a few days, he had a raging, massive ulcer, he was very sick, and they cured him with antibiotics. And all of a sudden, medical science had made a dramatic leap forward. You see, what we found out was that stress didn't cause ulcers. Ulcers cause stress. And we found a new type of bacteria, something called an acidophile. A bacteria that actually loved the acid in the stomach and thrived there. In fact, the stronger the acid, uh, the more it seemed to thrive. And so it wasn't the acid in the stomach that was eating away the lining of the stomach. It was the bacteria. The bacteria were thriving in it. So today, in the course of treatment for ulcers, and I've had it, okay, had the course of treatment, uh, they give you uh, an antibiotic regimen to kill the bacteria. And they give you something to lower the acidity, acidity of the stomach so that the bacteria uh, don't have uh, so much of a place to thrive. Now can you see there are two different kinds of thinking here? Uh, one used information that was already readily available to them, given to them. Okay? Sort of like a rule. And the others, well, they thought they had a rule, but they realized from the evidence that they didn't. And so what they did was they went on a method of exploration. They went to find the cause. This method right here is called deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning essentially uses a rule, okay, that's where you start, okay, and then applies a situation to it. This is a general rule, okay, here's a general rule, and uh, from that general rule, you're able to accommodate all kind of uh, specific examples, okay, we use this in mathematics all the time, all right, uh, in fact, far too often, I'm afraid, uh, we use things like uh, will say the quadratic formula. We say, how do you solve a quadratic formula? Well, here's, you know, 3x squared plus 5x minus 7. How do you solve it? Well, here's the rule, quadratic formula. x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And uh, you can get x, uh, the, the a for here, that's the 3, and the b here is the 5, and the c is the negative 7, and just stick it in that formula, and by gum, you'll solve it. It doesn't tell you a thing about where the formula came from, and it doesn't tell you a thing about uh, why the formula works, but uh, you can go back and put it in your calculators, or work it out by hand, and check the answer, and sure enough, it works. Well, so what? Okay, uh, it, uh, it works. It's deductive reasoning, okay? You've got a rule, a uh, general rule, you, you put a specific example with it. Now, as long as the rule is correct, then you're okay. You can use it. But it doesn't tell you anything really about the situation. Uh, it doesn't tell you why things work. And if the rule is wrong, then it's just plain difficult. For example, this group of scientists 
They thought they knew what caused ulcers. But as they were doing this research on people who had died from these massive ulcers, they began to realize that the rule they thought they had was wrong. So they had to go looking for something else. They applied the scientific method to it. They came up with a high, they, they did their observations and they came up with a hypothesis, essentially a question about what, how, uh, how the, uh, the processes actually worked. And then they tested it. And when they got done, they had a much, much better answer to the problem. Now, this kind of reasoning right here, okay, this kind of reasoning is inductive reasoning. And essentially, inductive reasoning looks at a pattern or example. pattern or example goes to write down some kind of a general conclusion or rule. Now in mathematics we want to use inductive reasoning because the thing is we have too many, many rules for the kids to memorize. Too many rules for any of us to memorize. I certainly can't memorize them all. But if we understand how to take a look at patterns and examples, how to take a look at how things work and how things operate, then we can wind up writing our own rules. And they'll be right. So this is inductive reasoning. And uh, you can see there are two very, very different kinds, but we work with them together.